Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and happy Easter. It's good to have you today. I hope that our, I hope that our technical difficulties you don't even notice. Maybe you don't see behind the scenes like I am. I've been having several te technical difficulties today. But you know what? Uh, it doesn't matter because it's good to be with you. And it is good to celebrate Easter together. I should say, Happy Resurrection Day. That's what I should say to you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and again, here we go. I'm having another one of my technical difficulties right there. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get out uh, and turn to Acts chapter 4, if you would, please. Um, Acts chapter 4. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about Peter and John and the first church. Now, while you're looking at that, Acts chapter 4, let me just invite you to something tonight. Two things. First of all, the, the notes for today's sermon uh, are on Facebook, on our Facebook page. If you'd like to get on our Facebook page, you can pull those notes up. And also, if you have our app, I sent them out on the app this morning, uh, CB Laverne. If you get on the app or the app store, you can find those notes for today's sermon. Also, let me invite you to tonight. At 5 o'clock tonight, 5 p.m., we're going to try something a little different. We're going to get on, uh, and we're going to do a Lord's Supper together. And uh, we're going to ask you to get your own elements ready, whatever you want to take, crackers or whatever you want to eat with it, uh, just to represent, uh, and the juice, whatever you want to get to, to drink, and, and just to represent what our Lord did for us on that cross some 2,000 years ago. And just to celebrate the fact that he didn't stay on that cross, he didn't stay in that tomb, that he's alive today. Amen. It's good to have you, and I hope that you'll be with us tonight. Uh, the details will be uh, on the Facebook page, etc., how to get with us, and we'll share that with you later. You'll see that on the Facebook page, and you can, and you can follow it. If you have any information, if you need more questions about it, you can also uh, send us an email to uh, our, through our email, through our email site, through our website. Or you can also check uh, with someone that's uh, on the page here, my phone number, et cetera. You can check and get that with us to, to, tonight. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. <clears throat> the Bible says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. And so they shared everything that they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. And there was no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one that the, uh, the apostles had nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus, and he sold the field that he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to sell everything you own and bring me the money today. That's not the point of this service. But it's good to be together with you, and you might think that that is some weird stuff that I'm reading on an Easter day, but I want to, I want to assure you they were celebrating the resurrection of Christ just like we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the scriptures. Lord, I thank you that we are praying to a living God and that we can celebrate together, even though it's over uh, the internet, Lord, that we're online. Lord, we can still celebrate that you're alive. And I also want to thank you, Lord, because I know that this is going to end. You're going to bring us back together soon, a month, two months, who knows how long. But Lord, I know that you're in charge, and I want to thank you that you're still on your throne and that you still give us hope, and that you still make us believe, and we know that we can trust you and we can rely on you in some very difficult and strange times. Lord, I ask your patience with us. I, Lord, that you would that you'd give me the right words this morning. If there's something that I've prepared that is not what you want me to share, I pray that you remove it. And Lord, whatever is said here, I pray that you would be given all the credit. Lord, anything that is worth listening to is not because of me. It's because you have done it through me, and I pray that you would just bless and prepare the hearts of those that are going to be listening to this today. So, Lord, we thank you and we love you for all that you have given us. For it's in your very precious name, Lord, we pray. Amen. 
Well, again, I want to say happy Easter to you all. It is good to be together with you. I want to thank somewhere out there in virtual land is Miss Lois Davis. She gave us these flowers back here. She did this for us. I want to say thank you to her. And I want to thank Miss Stephanie and Miss Kulandin. They do a fantastic job with the music. And also, I want to thank my two gentlemen that are helping. You don't see them behind the scenes, but if you're messaging to Facebook and you're getting answers back and you're wondering, wow, how is Pastor Link doing that? Well, the question, the answer is, I'm not doing that. That's Pastor Frank. He's doing that here. And also my friend Leonard, who is here running the uh, video. And if you're going to see this later on on YouTube, it's good to have you. And we thank Leonard for that. That's all due to his work. He uses his skills and his talents to edit those through the week and post those on YouTube. And I want to say thank you to him for doing that. So we have this, this story happening in Acts chapter 4. If you haven't been with us, we've been going through the study of Acts. And to give you a little context... These people are the early church. It hasn't been very long. It's only been about a couple months since Jesus has died on the cross, uh, rose again on the third day, which we celebrate today, and then also then spent 40 days on earth and then ascended. The Holy Spirit came a few days later, and now they have been just been um, just overfilled with the power of the Holy Spirit as this brand new church is beginning. And last week we talked about how Peter... And John were walking into the, temp the temple and they were going to go to pray. They, they saw a man next to the door that needed to be healed. They healed him. This lame man was healed. And, and the, the Sadducees, the people that were there, uh, that, that were watching this happen, they were not happy. They, they were part of the group, along with the Pharisees, that were mostly responsible for his crucifixion a couple months before Jesus' crucifixion. And, and uh, so they were not happy that they had seen Jesus walk around. They knew that he was alive. And they were even more so unhappy that Peter and John were in the temple that day proclaiming that this man had been healed, and it was through Jesus' name, it was through his power. And so they laid their hands on them, it says. The Bible says that they grabbed a hold of them strongly, and they arrested them, and they and locked them up overnight, and they had a trial the next day, if you want to call it that, and they brought them up and basically told them, in whose name have you done this? And Peter and John said, it was in Jesus' name. And so they were told, hey, stop doing that. Stop talking about Christ. Don't say that anymore. They knew they were between a rock and a hard place because uh, there stood the man that had just been healed. There stood these two men, not afraid to proclaim that it was Jesus that was doing this. And they had seen Jesus walk on the earth. And they were not happy about that. And they wanted to control their way of life. They wanted to keep their hands on the, on the purse strings, on the money, the way that they had their, their, their way that they lived their lives. They didn't want to give up their power and their control. And they didn't want to admit that they were wrong. And so they threatened Peter and John and said, don't go speak about Jesus ever again. And Peter and John said, you cannot stop us from talking about Christ. We're going to continue to talk about him. What, what were we going to do? Listen to you instead of God? And so they released them because they knew a mob might happen. A, you know, there might be a, a big a mob. Uh, come up if, if they did decided to let them go and so they let them go and so they they let them go and they went back to their fellow believers and were sharing what had happened and what turned out is that they had intended for them to stop preaching and talking about Christ and actually what happened is the opposite effect happened the people got in uh, encouraged and they got they got emboldened they got they got courageous knowing that Christ was in charge and that he was the one that had done this. And so the effect that they had, it had just the opposite effect. It didn't stop them from talking about Christ. It caused more people to be in, in excited about Christ and what he was doing in their lives in what we would call the early church. And so these people then are now in a situation where they get together, they're praying, they're excited. And you see in verse 31, right before we read, that they were praying and the walls shook. The Holy Spirit came and filled them and they were just, they were just so excited. They were on fire for the Lord. And then these verses happen and you have a, a glimpse of what the early church looked like in Acts chapter 4. Next week in Acts chapter 5, we will see the other side of this. You see, today we're going to see what the fellowship looked like and what we hope it looks like today in our churches. And then next week we'll see what the discipline looked like with a couple people named Ananias and Sapphira. 
And so you see here these, this early church and what they were made of or what they were like or, or what was happening, the inside kind of uh, the behind the scenes look at the, this early church and the fellowship that they had. You know, it reminds me, and you got to bear with me because I'm excited about this sermon, but it reminds me of uh, some things that I love. You know, I, I hate when I see people, Christians out there that are not excited about being able to serve a resurrected Lord. I see Christians out there sometimes that they, they seem like they're discouraged or they're down, etc. Let me tell you, I know that hard times are happening. I know that people are scared, they're afraid financially and, and about their health, etc. But our God still lives and he's still on his throne. And so I started thinking last night, I was on my couch finishing up the, the sermon, and I started thinking about, you know, they're, they're, what, is, what, is a, what is a church like? What should a church be like? What we're going to see here is a picture of what a church should be like as far as the unity in the church. And I thought of three things, okay? You're going to laugh at me, so just bear with me. It's okay. Number one, uh, I love the theater. Now, you may make fun of me about that. That's okay. But I love the theater. I love musicals. And I, and I think the part of what I love is that you have all these people with all these different talents. You have all these different abilities. You have some that can dance, some that can act, some that can sing, some people who can do all of that. And they bring all their talents together, and they all have a part to play right? Everybody has lines to memorize, and they all have a part to play, and they bring them together, and they all have a different uh, job. And when you bring them all together, you get something that is just really, really exciting, and it's fun, and, and people, it's, it's a work of art. It's beautiful. Speaking of work of art, I love music. I, I, love, I, love, I love going to concerts. I've been to a lot of different concerts, and I think about the, the music down in the orchestra pit at those at those plays or going to a, a concert, right? Like a, like a godly group like you 2 or something, you know, straight from God. Um, some group like that you go. And I just, I love, you know, if, 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 you, if you think about it, you have, a, you have a guitarist, you have a drummer, you have a singer, you have different instruments to come together. Have you ever heard a band warming up before a concert? Have you ever heard like the, the orchestra getting ready before a musical? And you hear some, you know, you hear the, the, the toots of the horn and you hear the, the drums and you hear the guitar and everything. And it sounds just so, you know, just messed up. But boy, when it's time to come together, every one of those instruments comes together and it makes something really super and beautiful. Then it also reminds me of my favorite sport, baseball. I remember uh, one of my favorite teams. If you know me, you know I'm a Dodger fan. I'm not just a Dodger fan. I am a fanatic all right, because that's the team that God wants you to be rooting for. I'm pretty convinced of that. And so I remember one of my favorite teams. I've been watching the Dodgers since my dad used to take me to games in the early 70s. And, and I remember one of my favorite teams I've ever, I've ever watched at the Dodgers was in 1988. The last time we won a World Series. Now, don't get me started a couple years ago with the Astros, okay? I'm going I'm to get away from that idea. But, uh, you know, uh, in 1988, the Dodgers ended up winning the World Series. And they won a, a, a five games. In five games, they beat the Oakland Athletics. And the Oakland, the Oakland A's had uh, Mark McGuire and Dave Parker and Jose Canseco and Dennis Eckersley. And they had Dave Stewart. They had all these just phenomenal players. I mean, just fantastic players. And then here came the Dodgers with a guy named Franklin Stubbs. Probably never even heard of him. Uh, Alfredo Griffin. I think he was hitting a buck 99 when the World Series started. Uh, Jeff Hamilton, guys like this, these were starters for the Dodgers. And I'll be honest, individually, they weren't anything to look at. All by themselves, they weren't anything real spectacular. And none of them would have started on the A's team. But you put those guys all together, and they used the talents that they had. And boy, together, collectively, they were something special. You know, it takes a team it takes people coming together and using their talents and their skills together. And, and, you know, sometimes you have in a church a bunch of people with a lot of talents who, who are just looking for someone to allow the Holy Spirit to use them in a mighty way. And then all of a sudden those talents will start coming together and they'll start doing something that is extra special. One of my favorite stories about that 88 Dodger team is this, is this player, this guy they got in free agency named Kirk Gibson. He had the, the big 
dramatic home run in, in game one of that World Series. The first day of spring training, the story goes that he came in and the Dodgers were goofing around and having fun and laughing around and doing a lot of things that like baseball players do in spring training. And Kirk Gibson uh, used a, a few special adjectives that I'm not allowed to use. And he chewed them out and basically told them, hey, guys, uh, we're not going to do that anymore. This is serious. And they knew from the day one that they had somebody there who had a different approach. He had a different mindset. And Peter and John were different than what they had been before. Peter especially. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. When one person gets filled with the Holy Spirit, boy, watch out, because they can do mighty, mighty things. When one person gets filled with the Holy Spirit, they can do things that, man, you would just not believe how powerful what God can do through one person submitting and allowing the Holy Spirit. Um, so you've got, you got, you got to understand that when you allow the Holy Spirit to be in charge of you, oh man, let me tell you something. People are not going to be happy. They're not going to be comfortable. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. Some of us Christians, we've gotten too comfortable. The thing about being a Christian in our lives today is that, is that idea of other Christians being against us. Other Christians, when a Christian allows the Holy Spirit to really lead them and guide them and be in charge, I, boy, sometimes other Christians get real uncomfortable with that. I think of a, another, it's another sports reference. I'm, I got a lot of sports references today. I think about a, a, a football player that if you're a college football fan, you might know the name better than the pro fans would. But Danny Warfel is a Christian man, and he won the Heisman Trophy in 1996. And, and he played in the NFL for several years, mostly a backup. And, and uh, he was offered a chance to go join the Washington Redskins, by, actually by his old college coach. And he declined he turned down millions of dollars. And you say, well, he must have had some better offer on the table. Maybe he was going to go be an announcer or, or make some money in, you know, in the business world or something. No. Danny Warfel had decided that he would go down and, and be part of a, of a group that was working with a down and out to, called Desire Street Ministries in New Orleans. In a very, very poor area in New Orleans. So was working with some of the roughest kids there were in that area of the, of the country. And I remember there were Christians that were saying, you know, it was irresponsible, that he was not thinking about his future. They were saying negative things about him when this happened, when this came out in the news. And I remember, you know, just having um, heard of him just a few times outside of this. And I started listening and reading about his testimony and what an awesome man. And he says, you know what, um, I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do and not what other people tell me to do. And boy, I'll tell you what, there was a lot of people that looked at him and questioned that decision. But he said, I, I don't care what people say. I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit is calling me to do. And that's just a, a man showing that sometimes when you allow the Holy Spirit to use you, uh, boy, you're going to make some people uncomfortable. But I'll tell you what, it's always going to be what the Lord wants for you in your life. And then you can get, you know, a group of people that will, uh, then if you can get a group of people that will do that and they will follow, not just one guy, but if you can get a group of people together who will allow the Holy Spirit to use them, Wow, that's what was happening here. This kind of unity in this church, in the verses we read this morning, this is the kind of unity that we want. And there's no end to what our God can do when you get a bunch of people who are together and they're going to follow what the Holy Spirit calls them to do. And that's what you see in Acts chapter 4. These guys had no, this is an infant church. They had no formal training. They didn't have Robert's rules of order to follow. They didn't have a blue book. They didn't have the, the church you know, doctrinal statement. They didn't have the, the, you know, the, the 95 thesis you know, pasted on the door or something. They didn't have any of that stuff. They just had a bunch of people who were being, and, and this is a word that I think is very much lost in 2020. They were, your outline, if you have the outline today, they were loyal to Christ and to their church. And when you have a group of people, when you have a group of believers who believe that, that Christ has risen from the grave and they have the Holy, they're filled with that Holy Spirit and they're, and they're ready to be loyal to their God and to their fellow church members. Wow, you have something that is just amazing. And that's what that was, this, this, this infant church. They were on fire. Look at the verses that we read there in verse 32. You see there in verse 32, it says, All the believers were united in heart and mind. When was the last time you could say 
All the believers in your church were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Did you notice what I just read? They had a singleness of purpose. They were of one heart, and they were of one mind. You'll notice later in the reading, we already read, but you'll notice later in the verses, there was no committee that had to get together. You know, us Baptists, we got to have committee and fried chicken. That's what we got to do if we're going to meet and make a decision, right? We can't make a decision without, without meetings, right? So they didn't, need, they didn't have committees. They didn't have, you know, they didn't, they didn't argue about who's going to get this much and how much of this and how much of that. They just, they, they didn't say, well, this project's more important than that project, and I want to do this, and we want to do that. They sold their possessions that they had. They felt led by the Holy Spirit to do that, and they took it, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and they said, you know what? You're in charge. We follow your direction. We believe you're the one that's been called by God to lead us. We trust you. We're in one mind. We're in one accord. We are all on the same page. We're all pulling from the same side of the rope. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they always agreed. I'm not telling you that you need to go out today and find a church that you always agree with because you ain't going to find it. Okay? Any church that has people is going to have people that disagree. It's just natural, okay? It's just human nature. Because unity is not the same as uniformity. Unity is not the same as uniformity. Everyone is different. Everyone has a role to play. Remember that 88 Dodger team I was talking about? And that one guy that came and he was so intense and he came in later, Kurt Gibson. I want you to imagine for a second. I want you to imagine if the Dodger team was full of 25 Kurt Gibsons. Now, you may say, oh, man, they would have won all kinds of World Series. Uh, I beg to differ. I think they would have killed each other before the first game happened. I think they would have drove each other nuts. I think they they couldn't have been. Can you? I tease with my church sometimes, and I say, can you imagine if we had a church of Lincolns? It would drive each other crazy. We'd kill each other. We'd never get out of the church. We'd kill each other in here. Okay? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you went to that concert of that band that I was talking to you about? Your favorite group. Your favorite group has a big concert. You go there, and they've decided, you know, we're not going to play the other instruments. All five of us in the band, we're all going to play the drums. Um, it's not going to sound the same. It's just not going to sound, it's not going to be as rich. It's not going to be as full. It's not going to be as complete. It's not going to be as beautiful. Can you imagine if everybody at that play all decided they wanted to play the same part, and you had 30 people in a cast all playing the same part, saying the same lines at the same time? You'd leave. You wouldn't want to watch that. There's no teamwork. There's no togetherness. There's no using my strengths to help your weaknesses and using your strengths to help my weaknesses. And there's no, you know, that, what's beautiful about music is you have those instruments that come together and they complement each other perfectly. You know, you have the one guitar and another guitar. You have the bass. You have the lead. I, I'm not an instrument guy. I'm not a musician, but you have the drummer and you have, I don't know, the guys on the horns and you got the saxophone. You got, and you put all that together and boy, oh boy, it sounds beautiful. It's, it's, an, it's a symphony comes together by different talents, different gifts, everybody coming together. And that's what this church or this ecclesia was. It was a group of called out believers. They believed in Christ. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were called out with a purpose. They had a mission. They had a, they had a direction that they were headed because they wanted to accomplish great things. Let me, let me explain to you something. If you're in education out there, you've probably heard of uh, Common Core. Now, some people love Common Core. Some people don't. Let me, let me tell you about, the, you, you people argue about Common Core math. Well, you want to get some, you want to see an argument. I don't know why you'd want to see an argument. But if you want to see an argument, get a couple, three teachers to start discussing what kind of math they should teach. And you might get some, some heated discussions. Well, let me tell you about God's math. Okay, you ready? You remember doing greater than or less than or equal to? Remember that? Am I bringing up bad memories of your educational past? Um, greater than, less than, equal. Let me tell you about God's math. One is greater than 100. Now, I say 100 because that's kind of like what is represented by our church. We have about 100 every Sunday, maybe a little less, a little more, whatever. But you could put any number you want to in that second blank. One is greater than 1,000. One is greater than 10,000. In other words, when you had that play, that, 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 that troop of people in that play together... One common purpose means that everyone is going to sacrifice and do whatever it takes so that the entire production is its best. 
And when you have a church, a group of believers, and they have one common purpose, they can do great things if that purpose is to fulfill the Holy Spirit's direction for their group or for their lives or for that, for that church group. Can you imagine if you had, you know, your favorite band get up there and all five band members play five different songs at the same time? And you say, oh, one of those songs is my favorite. You wouldn't be able to tell because it would sound horrible. They're not working together. They're not using uh, their gifts wisely to complement what the other ones lack. And that's what this body of believers did. They showed everyone that their God, their Savior, that they believed in, Jesus Christ, He didn't just die on that cross. He didn't just arise again. He didn't just come out of that tomb. He didn't just ascend and disappear in their eyes. He still lived. He was still with them. In the, in the form of the Holy Spirit, he was still there. They still had him. He still lived. And he was still working and moving. And he still is today in 2020. He's still alive. And he's still working. And he's still moving. You see, they understood that their gifts could complement what the other ones needed. The things that other people had would complement what they needed. They understood that when you meet the needs of the other ones in your, in your church family, you reflect well on your Savior. It's, it's such an ugly thing to see in society today, especially since we have so much media out there, to see people who will fight in a church and it gets public. And they have some kind of big split or some kind of big disagreement. Every once in a while, I will meet someone out there that knows I'm a Christian, knows I'm a pastor, and they will say, oh, did you hear about such and such church? And I think to myself, you don't even go to that church. How do you know? It's become public. It's become ugly. It's a bad example. It's a bad witness for Christ. These people were a great witness for Christ. Why? Because they were all there for an other common purpose, which was Christ. They had his his, that's just an amazing oneness of mind, that, 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 that heart and mind, heart and soul, depending on what version you have, is awesome. The word meant, you know, what were they thinking? What was their direction? Where were they headed? What was their mindset? They had a mission statement. They had a purpose. They all were going in the same direction. Let me ask you a question this morning. How is your, how is your witness for the Lord individually, your personal witness? How is it for the Lord? I mean, the way you live your life. The way, they lived, the way the church lived, this early church, the way they did church was a testimony to other people. So let me ask you, the way you live your life, is it a testimony for Christ? The way you go get your uh, takeout food, the way you go shopping, the way you go outside and do your yard work, the way you do your everyday routine mundane tasks that you think are not that important, I would suggest to you they are very important because everything you do reflects on the Savior. How do you treat people? How do you treat that waitress when he or she comes, that waiter, when they come to the table and, and they want to get your order? How do you treat them when that food comes a little slower than you thought? How do you, how do you treat them when the people who are sitting in the booth next to you, back when we used to be able to go to restaurants, remember that, those times? Um, how do you treat the restaurant, how do you treat the waiter or the waitress when the people who sit in the booth next to you sat after you, but they get served their food before you? Hmm. You say, well, that's not right. They need to take care. Let me tell you something. I, 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 don't, I don't want to hear. You know what's more important than when you get served your food? You know what's more important than you being hungry? You, you, know, you know, your tummy rumbling. You know what's more important is your witness for Christ. How you treat people. These people in this early church treated each other with love. They pooled their resources together. And the impression they gave was a wonderful witness to the world out there watching them act. Well, then it goes to verses 34 and 35, and I want you to notice something about them selling their possessions and, and saying, hey, if there were people that had needs, they would bring it, they'd sell their stuff, they would bring it, they would give it to the apostles and say, hey, it's all yours. Take it, use what you know is needed, give it to who you know needs it, etc. They, they were just pooling their resources. Remember, they had to because they were being attacked, they were being, uh, they were being pressured, uh, they were being 
Uh, they were under scrutiny and, and intense. I want to say persecution is a good word because the people around them, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, the legalistic people of the Jews, even the Romans who couldn't care less about Christ at that time, majority of them, uh, they, didn't want to, they didn't want to have anything to do with God. They didn't want them talking about God and speaking about God. And so they, had to, they couldn't work. They couldn't get jobs. They couldn't make money, et cetera. And so they had to pool what they had together. And so they, they pulled that, they brought that together, and they gave it to the disciples. And I, and I want you to notice something that's not there, but I want you to notice what's not there. And that is that um, it wasn't mandatory. It doesn't say in here, right? Luke does not say in writing this, he does not say that uh, Peter got up and told everyone that the new command was this. The 11th commandment is this, or the new rule we're going to live our lives by is this. Or that's not, that's not, that never happened. That didn't, it didn't go down that way. They were led individually by the Holy Spirit to give what they could give. They were led by the Holy Spirit to see the needs uh, and, and, the, and to try to meet the needs of their fellow church members. They had, that, that, we're talking about, that's real Christian love. They were motivated not by trying to look good or, or uh, you know, make people like them or I don't, whatever other motivations people do things for. Uh, they were motivated by Christian love. Um, direct Christian love that had no strings attached. No strings attached. I mean, they, they were doing this because they felt like Christ was telling them to do it. And they didn't have to have anything in return. They weren't trying to, you know, get an investment back. Or they weren't trying to say, if you scratch your back, I'll scratch mine. You, you know, wait, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. One of those things. That, that's not what they want. They didn't want that. They were giving because it was pure, unconditional Christian love. And that's a beautiful thing. You see, these people understood something about their stuff. And I want you to catch this today. And I'm hoping that this whole COVID-19 thing helps us recognize this as well. And that is that our possessions, the stuff that we own, belongs to God. You don't own it. It really belongs to God. They understood that the stuff they had wasn't theirs. When you get your perspective right on the things around you, stuff around you, all of a sudden you get a better view for what you're really looking at. You ever been watching something and it's gotten really fuzzy, like TV, or maybe you're trying to focus in with your camera on your phone or something, and, and it's really fuzzy and you can't get it to focus? You know, a lot of us Christians have that fuzzy kind of focus, and we can't focus right on what God wants us to do because we're so wrapped up with our stuff, our things. Now, and I want you to, to expand that a little bit too, not just the things, but your talents, your abilities, your gifts. What you bring, what God has given you, what do you have? Your abilities, your ability to listen, to encourage, to, to uh, write notes, to whatever it is, whatever you can do well, whatever it is that you do, you host people well, are you, um, you, you have a strong back, you have a brand new car, you can share, you can, we were talking in our Sunday school class this morning about all the things that we can do, all of the things that are kind of, you know, not, not the main things that we think about when we think about gifts and talents, but they're still gifts from God. You know that car that works? Thank God for that car. That home that God's given you, thank God for that, car, that home. Uh, think about that. God gave you those things so that you could take care of yourself, but, but even more so than that, so that you could bless others with what you have. And these people understood that the stuff they owned did not belong to him. That belonged to God. And so they had a mutual care. They were able to finally mm, focus and realize, ah, oh, that's what the stuff is for. Oh, I thought this stuff was for me to enjoy, or for me to be, you know, me, myself, and I, and for me to be happy, or me to have fun. No, that's not why God gave it to you, right? You've heard that expression that you've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it, because you don't take it with you. What are you going to do with it? God's going to, he's going to, remember, remember the three guys that were given the talents? The master came back and he asked, you know, what have you done with it? He had an, they had to be held accountable for what they've done. You know, you may be looking at what other people have and think you don't have a lot, but I guarantee you there are millions of people in the world who would look at what you have and say, you have a lot. And the question is, what is the Savior saying that you're doing with what you have? This day on Easter, we celebrate that our Savior is alive. Are you sharing that? Are you sharing that with people? 
Are you acting in such a way that makes people understand and recognize that you are excited because you serve a risen Savior? Or are you walking around with your tail between your legs, acting like, you know, the world is bad and oh, poor me. A lot of Christians out there who need to get their eyes up and focus on others and see that they've been given so much. This church that we're talking about here had a deep care. They had a compassion. They had a love for other people. And they wanted to love them more than what anything they wanted themselves. And then he gives in the end of the verses that we read this morning an example. Verses 36 and 37, I think, they have this guy Barnabas. They nicknamed him Barnabas. And I'm going to use his name, that nickname, Barnabas, because he was the son of encouragement. Now, depending on what commentaries you read, they might be called something else. Some people believe it was a little different translation, but I'm going to use the, the, the one that most people kind of go with, and that's this son of encouragement. Obviously, this guy, who we find out more about later, he becomes a, a bigger player in the, in the new way or the Christian faith here in the early days of the church. Later, he becomes a big, big name. But um, obviously, this guy was a kind of a glass half full kind of person. He was a guy who said, you know what, uh, I, um, <clears throat> I recognize that there are tough things out there. I recognize today he would have said, Barnabas would have said, you know, I recognize that I'm, you know, I'm kind of quarantined in or I can't work or maybe my ability to make more money is down. But you know what, I can still be used of God to do mighty things. This man understood that what he had wasn't his anyway. It was God's. You know, you parents out there, you know, those kids that you have at home, they're God's. You know, that, that, those possessions you have at home, that, that 401k that you have, that, that paycheck that you get, whatever, all that stuff belongs to God. And so he understood that. Okay? He understood that what he had was God's. And so he's a good example. And we don't know. He was a Levite. We don't know why he had land. Maybe it seems like they were getting away from some of the traditions or rules that they had. They weren't supposed to own land. And maybe he had more land. I don't know. But the point is this. He was a good example of being generous. I wonder if people hear your name and they think to themselves, oh, that's a generous person. Oh, I love them. They're a generous person. They, they give of their time. They give of their talents. They give of their love. They give of their, maybe it's a listening ear. Maybe, you know, they, they let you borrow their car. They let you borrow their house. They let you borrow their whatever it is that you need. They're very generous. I wonder if people think you are a generous person. Well, that's what they thought about, about Barnabas. And I'll tell you, he gave a great example of how we could be generous. Now, again, I want to come back to what I started with before we close out. And that's, I'm not calling you to go sell all your possessions. I'm not telling you that you have to give me a bunch more money. I'm not saying you have to send a bunch more money to your church. I'm not saying any of that. That's not what I'm talking about. That is between you and the Holy Spirit. My point is that the Barnabas listened to the Holy Spirit, and that's what the Holy Spirit told him to do. And my question is, are you doing what Barnabas knew he had to do, and that is listening to the Holy Spirit? Are you doing what the Holy Spirit has called you to do? Let me give you some examples as we close here about ways to give um, at, in this kind of time. And I, and I know that right now it's hard to give. You understand? I know it is. I'm not necessarily, unless the Holy Spirit's convicting you about your tithing, then you need to deal with that. But I'm not necessarily just talking about tithing here. I want you to see uh, something bigger than just money. Okay, Barnabas' example was money, but it doesn't have to be money. And I'm going to give you three examples, things to think about in being generous on this Easter day. And they're going to start with O-N-E, because we're one. And if we're one body... With one purpose, God can accomplish great things. So number one, that O, I say, stands for open your heart. You say, what do you mean? Well, I think it stands to reason that if you need help, then other people need to know that you need help, right? I think some of us are a little too guarded. Now, I know we need to be private. Now, I know some of us are, some of, you know, there's, there's people like me. I could talk to a rock. I don't care. I could talk to a bunch of strangers. It doesn't matter. And then there's some people that are very, very shy and not so easily uh, vulnerable like that. But I'm going to challenge you today. We need to be more vulnerable. I think it's pride. A lot of Christians today are proud, and they're too proud to share what they're struggling with. Now, I'm not saying you go out and you, you know, you lay out all the, uh, dirty gossip out there on the, 
on the internet. And I'm not, God doesn't need all that junk. I'm just saying that when you have a need, you need to be able to share it. If you have a struggle in your life, you can't be afraid to share that. How can I pray for you and your need if I don't know what the need is? Now, again, I know there are some things that are private. I, I understand that. I'm not, I'm not talking about those things. I, let's, let's show a little sense here. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about those things where we're just a little too proud to admit that we have some challenges and we need prayer or we need help. When you share what you're going through, it could be that someone in your church reaches out to you and says, hey, I know exactly what you're going through because I went through the same thing. I have the same challenge. I am a recovering blank, whatever it is that you're going through. You've got to be able to open your heart and share with others. Stop pretending. Your name is not Rambo, okay? You're not, you know, Mr. Big and Tough Guy, that you can handle everything. And I'm talking specifically to the men out there. We tend to be a little proud and not admit that we have any concerns or worries or cares. But um, it goes for the ladies as well. We don't want to admit that we have, you know, faults or weaknesses. And I, and I wonder why. I mean, does, are, are you actually thinking that someone's out there thinking, wow, they must be perfect and have no problems? I mean, we all have problems. So we need to be able to admit it. We need to be vulnerable enough to admit that we have problems so that you're not robbing someone else of the opportunity to bless you. When did you bless someone recently? Have you, can you think of a time when you blessed someone recently? I hope you can. Do you remember how great that made you feel? How just, it just made you feel like your heart was full and you're like, man, I allowed God to use me. It was a good thing. It, you didn't do it for your own benefit, but, but God blessed you with a, a good, you know, a full heart because of that. Now, can you imagine if that person that you helped robbed you of that blessing? How, how much that would hurt to have lost that? I wonder how many times I have robbed, you have robbed, someone around us of the chance to love me and to bless me and to be used by God to intervene in my life because I won't share those concerns. I wonder how many times that's happened. Open your heart and be vulnerable to share what you're struggling with. Number two is you got to notice the in. you got to notice other people's needs. Now, once you've shared your needs, get your eyes up off yourself, sort of like what I kind of talked to you about last week. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and start looking at the needs of other people. Once you are honest about where you're struggling, I'm going to tell you what helps me. When I'm struggling with something, and I can get down, I can get negative, I can get, man, I am either way up high or way down low. Ask my wife, I, I'm sure I'm driving her crazy. She's been stuck with me a month in the house. I'm surprised and I'm not dead already. Um, I can get way up high, way down low. I can get so discouraged. I can get so happy and so hyper. Uh, you know, let me, let me tell you something. Sometimes uh, when I get down low like that, the best thing for me is to just dust myself off and go help somebody do something. The other day, my brother, uh, my friend here at our church, Gordo, and I, we went to go help a lady at the Casitas Mobile Home Park. I'm hoping she's getting to watch this, Miss Barbara, if you're watching. Um, it was so good to get to meet you. We went and tried to help her patch her roof because she needs a new roof, and um, it was raining, and it was leaking in on her, in her house, in her, in her, at the mobile home. And um, I started thinking about, you know, how great an example how great an example Gordo is helping people. He's helped so many people. If you have the privilege of getting to know him, you know I'm talking about. He's helped so many people so many times. He's helped me. I can't even tell you how many times he's helped me, including this week. He's helped me uh, with an emergency I had. And, and he, just, he does that all the time. Can you imagine if I took those opportunities away from him and I didn't give him the opportunity to help. Can you imagine if I didn't share that? How are those things going to get fixed if I don't share that? If this sweet lady had not shared that she had a, a problem with the roof, how could somebody fix the roof? And you've got to open your heart and look up and see what's happening around you. And I'm telling you, when you do that, when you look around and see who needs help, who might need help, and I'm not saying butting in, I'm not seeing, I'm not, listen, I'm not telling you to go be meddlesome and get into people's, you know, details and the juicy gossip. I'm not talking about that junk. I'm talking about you looking around and seeing. When was the last time you said a prayer like this? Lord, <clears throat> help me to recognize the needs of others and then have the courage to see it through. When was the last time you said a prayer like that? I was telling my Sunday school class earlier, it, I don't think a lot of people will pray that way because it's a little scary, isn't it? It's almost, like scare, it's almost like saying in your prayer, uh, Lord, help me to know if I should be a missionary on the other side of the world. 
It's almost like Christians, they don't want to say that prayer because they're afraid of the answer they might get. And I think sometimes us Christians, we Christians are afraid of saying a prayer like that and asking God to help us recognize the needs of other people because we're afraid of how much work it might be. Well, I got news for you. It is work. It is work. It's not convenient. It's not easy to help other people. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it takes a lot of time. It's not fun all the time. I'm not telling you that it's all, you know, gumdrops and rainbows and unicorns every time you try to help somebody. It's not. It's hard. But the Lord is going to bless you because of it. And it may not be financial blessing. It may not be, you know, monetary or physical. But be a, it could be a blessing within the heart. It could be to make your heart feel, you know, full that God is doing something great with you, through you. Because it's God doing it. Now, it's not us. It's God doing it. Get your eyes off of yourself, number two, and look for those that need help. Um, I have learned it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power, because I don't have a lot, and I'm telling you right, it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to notice and recognize when somebody needs help. And lastly, number three, the E stands for just to encourage one another. Barnabas had a nickname called the Encourager. He was a son of encouragement. What an awesome nickname. Is there somebody in your life that when you get around them, they just make you feel better? They just kind of lift your spirits? Um, I, I liken it to, I've shared it with our church at times, I liken it to, have you ever walked through the mall and, and walked through the, um, the perfume section? I mean, you know the perfume section is coming before you get there. And then when you walk through, you can tell somebody has tried some samples on when you get to the Foot Locker or somewhere else, wherever you're going. You can tell, oh, they tried on some perfume samples. I can smell it. When they leave, you're like, oh, they've been here. You ever, you ever I, I've had the privilege of teaching some young high school boys and junior high boys who uh, wear a whole lot of cologne, sometimes too much cologne, right? And they leave the room, and you're like, oh, so-and-so had been here. Johnny, Johnny was just here, I know, because he left his aroma. Well, let me, let me tell you, Christians should have that kind of effect on people, not smelly, aqua velva. I'm talking about they should have that kind of uh, uh, impact on people's lives. So that when you leave, people recognize they miss you. They recognize that you're a blessing to them. You're an encouragement to them. You lift the spirits of the room. Teachers will tell you that there's always those students that when that one student is not in class, boy, the whole activity of the class kind of goes down like this and it's a lot easier to teach. And they don't want to say it out loud, but they're thinking to themselves, I'm kind of glad Johnny's not at school today. Because they can kind of handle the class better, right? And when that kid comes back, boy, the whole activity level of the class goes up, right? Well, listen, as Christians, we should have that kind of impact, but as an encouragement to people, when we walk in a room, people should be encouraged. They should be uplifted. Why? Because of something I'm doing? No, because of who resides in me. He will lift your spirits. Let me, let me tell you something about lifting your spirits. Jesus lives today. Easter is the day that we celebrate. We recognize that Jesus died on the cross, went into that grave, conquered death, rose again, and walked around, and he lives today. And you can live forever, too, with him if you have a personal relationship with him. Some of you are out there watching this right now, and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. And I'm telling you right now, ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do is bow your heads, close your eyes, and just say, Lord, forgive me my sins, and please come in and be my Savior. Help me to begin to be the kind of person you want me to be. Forgive me of my sins. Come in and be in charge of my life. Get out of the driver's seat. Get over to the passenger side and let him be in charge. Some of you I'm speaking to out there, a long time ago gave your life to Christ. And you're on your way to heaven. You're going to heaven. You're saved. But it's been a long time since you lived with that resurrection power, with that resurrection energy, since you acted like you were uh, uh, full of the Holy Spirit and His power. It's been a long time. And I want to encourage you today that there's no better time than right now to give Christ control of your life. There's no better time than to get rid of those issues. Maybe you've thought about something while I was preaching here today. The Lord, the Holy Spirit brought something to mind that you struggle with. It could be pride, it could be uh, lying, it could be a particular sin, it could be, uh, you know, some kind of something you think the world can't see. I got news for you. Uh, Christ knows. He sees it. And what better day than Easter Sunday to get those things right with him. 
we welcome you to come back with us tonight. We'll get on tonight, and, and uh, there'll be more information about that on the Facebook page, you know, following the service today. Um, we welcome you to come back at 5 o'clock tonight and recognize and remember just kind of a symbolic gesture, the Lord's Supper, communion, to remember what Jesus did for us because he died on that cross and he rose again. You see something today. If you see something with a cross and Jesus still hanging on there, remember what I'm telling you. Jesus is no longer on that cross. He lives. He lives. My Savior lives today. We, we love you. We miss you. I can't wait till you hear, and I can hear you say amen. I see that some of you are typing amen. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm praying that you guys are safe, that you are healthy, that you are, are, are okay financially, etc. In line with this sermon today, if you have needs, you need to share those. Let us know how we can help you. Maybe I can't, but maybe someone else here from the, from the, from the church congregation can. And if you don't have a church family then maybe this is the family that God wants you to be a part of. There's no perfect family. We're not perfect. We make mistakes too. But I guarantee you we love the Lord and we'd love to serve him along with you. So have a great Easter Sunday. We love you. Happy Easter. And hopefully we'll see you again in person very soon. God bless you, everybody. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the chance to worship you. I pray, Lord, that there's those out there that doesn't know you uh, as their personal Savior. Lord, I pray that you would just reach in right now Touch their hearts, though, that they would accept you right now, that, they would, that you would weigh heavily on them so they know that they need you as their personal Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you would just encourage those people that are suffering, those that are hurting financially because of this, this virus, because of this disease. Lord, I pray that you would just comfort them, encourage them. Those that have the means to help, whether it's just with their time, their talents, their money, their efforts, their whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you'd help them, that we'd reach out and we'd look for people who are hurting, and that we'd be a light in what could be a very dark time. But Lord, you're still in charge. You're still alive. You still, you still reign on your throne. So Lord, I just pray that we'd give you control. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. In your very precious name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and happy, happy Easter, everyone.